pressure. <laughs> Um, so just to break in the surprise, uh, we have this uh, software developer who developed software for flying planes and then he, got, he decided to actually see how piloting planes really is and he decided to become an end user, so he became a pilot and then when his company went down under, not by his own doing, mind you, but independently. So when his company went under, he went back into software development, thus completing the cycle. And uh, since he's not flying airplanes anymore, he took the time to come uh, at ITACAN conference 2018. So because I don't really know how to spell his family name, let's just welcome warmly Alexander. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, mission critical uh, software uh, and uh, especially flight simulators. As an airline pilot, uh, I was trained on simulators because we would like to be trained in simulators before, uh, you know, crashing real planes with real passengers on board. That's pretty bad. And um, I'm going to tell you about uh, a little bit about my, uh, my story. Uh, I'm going to start as a, as a disclaimer, as usual. Uh, I work for a company uh, called CAE in Montreal. That's where we're building simulators. And I'm part of uh, a company called House of Test. What you're going to see is just my personal opinion. I mean, you, you're going to be totally free to do what, whatever you want with what you can take out of my speech. But this is just personal, uh, personal expression. Um, who knows what a flight simulator is for pilots? Who saw one? Uh, not everybody. So what I'm going to do, um, I'm going to present you a short video about the company in Montreal. And um, so we're making flight simulators for training pilots, but we're making also simulators for doctors and nurses, uh, like, for example, birth uh, simulators or uh, pacemaker simulators and stuff like that. So you're going to see a 90 seconds video about my world, where I was coming from. This video was just to give you an idea about what is simulation and what we are doing uh, for training uh, for training pilots. Um, let's jump into the uh, into the subject now. There we go. So, what are the common points in between simulations um, for uh, training pilots, like the one we see on simulation what can run on uh, small computers? Um, simulation that can run on so-called IPTs, which are a little bit more evolved uh, ways of training uh, pilots. Full flight simulators, like those ones, where we are now getting closer to be able to fly in the airplane, and actual airplanes. What the common point between all those devices? Well, the common point is the ICAO the Internal uh, Aviation Authority. It's um, under the uh, United uh, Nations, 
and it covers all the world of the airlines. Uh, they make sure that every airline is compliant with some rules that those uh, uh, that uh, company is uh, is making, and uh, they are very strict about it. Uh, so strict that if you don't follow the process, you're liable uh, in front of court. And that is uh, what I call mission critical uh, software. In my case, uh, when I deliver a simulator uh, to uh, a company in the world, there are actually three signatures on the certificate for the simulators. There is the aviation authority, a signature, there is the airline signature, and there is my signature, on, uh, on that paper, meaning that if it's a, it's a statement, by putting your signature, you say, well, I tested the software, I tested the hardware, and it's compliant with all the rules from the AKO, and it performs exactly as per aircraft. So you can imagine the amount of pressure you can have as a test pilot or test engineer when you sign those papers, because you're liable in court for the next 20 years or something, if something wrong into, into that software. And actually, uh, during this talk, um, I won't have time to cover everything related to software testing. Uh, for example, how I did all the automation using fitness, how I changed the process inside the company, and I strongly encourage you to talk to me after uh, this speech or to meet me tomorrow, because tomorrow I'm going to spend the whole day here just also to answer questions if you have, uh, if you have any. Um, the requirement is pretty thin. We're just talking about 600 pages of requirement from the uh, Aviation Authority. Um, my suggestion is that we go for each page uh, during this talk. It's going to be uh, pretty fast. Um, it's available online if you want to have a look. Uh, I can send you, uh, send you the link. Um, but it's, yeah, it's, a, it's a lot of documentation. What are we simulating? Well, <laughs> I think the quickest answer is what we are not simulating, because actually we're simulating a lot of things inside the simulator. What you see here is um, a 777 simulator uh, with the uh, instructor here with that screen. Uh, the guy can reposition the aircraft on any airport in the world. And you've got the two uh, monkeys in the front uh, doing the, uh, the check ride. Um, um, so the things we're not simulating, uh, to give you a couple of examples, we're not simulating the ocean tide. Like, for example, if you are close to an airport which is close to sea level and you have the ocean tide, we're not simulating, uh, simulating those things. Um, we're not simulating... It's pretty, pretty hard. Um, on, the op on the opposite, I can tell that we are simulating, for example, the heat of uh, passengers into the cabin. So if my airplane is, the guy in the back say, your airplane is heavy, I will have fuel and I will have passengers. Inside the cockpit of that airplane, I have an indication of the cabin temperature. If I have more passengers into the cabin, the temperature of the cabin is going to rise. We're simulating up to that extent uh, for, for simulation. So just think about that and think how you're going to test that thing. Because it covers the visual system, what you see outside as, a, as pilots. So everything you see should be as reality. Everything you see, everything you feel should be exactly as per the, uh, as per the airplane. So why we are using simulators? Well, we're using simulators in order to train pilots for normal situation, which is normal operation. So for example, here, this is an approach plate for the uh, airport in Addis uh, Ababa. Uh, so for us, it's daily routine to read those charts and being able to land the airplane in, in, in there. But we're not building simulators just for that. We're building simulators for training for abnormal situation. An abnormal situation like this one is when you land and your wing gets on fire. Uh, this happened because of a fuel leak, uh, so there is a, a, a hole into the uh, fuel tank, and the fuel went into the, uh, onto the engine and, of course, caught fire. So as pilots, we would like to be trained in order to perform proper uh, operations. And you as passengers, yeah, especially if you're sitting close to the uh, emergency exit, you know the hostess is coming to you and saying, well, do you know how to open this? 
this is where it's getting very important. So, you know, some people, they just go there and you have rooms for the legs, but you have to be aware that maybe one day you will have to perform an emergency evacuation. So take it very uh, seriously, please, for my, uh, for my colleagues. Um, also, bad landings. I mean, <laughs> you know, uh, sometimes uh, you don't have proper conditions, like maybe you have a wind gust or whatever, and then suddenly uh, you smash the runway, and then you have a tire which is going to explode, and at the end, this is the, the shape of your tire. So, how do you test a flight simulator that it represents that you have a blown tire? You just have to think about all the parameters that are going to be uh, affecting your, your simulation. So how we test those things? Well, at least we're lucky in aviation because we got we we love old stuff, you know. Aviation, we're not changing things because we love uh, the new Java framework or the new Eclipse framework. We, we we don't do that. We have something which is working and we are using it until it breaks and becomes like no bearable. Then. Uh, we try to change it. And uh, one thing that has been on the market for a long time, it's the DOD, Department of Defense. Uh, American uh, created some documents in order to uh, help people designing uh, software into mission critical uh, environment. And that documentation covers not only uh, kind of recommendations about tool that uh, should be used, but also the process that needs to be followed in order to achieve uh, a good, a good software and something which is uh, safe. So I'm not going to talk in details about DOD. That's something that you can discover by yourself by looking onto the, uh, onto the website. You can also download the documentation and see uh, what good things you can grab from, uh, from that methodology. Uh, when we build simulators, the simulators they are built for about lasting 20 years. It's like airplanes. So if you look at the 737, this 737, is, it's an old fart into the, uh, into the aviation, uh, aviation business. And the simulators that are built are also built for lasting a, a long time. When we build simulators, what we try to achieve is to control everything around the simulators. So in order to run the simulation, you have to have a computer. Actually, we got several computers, but you know, for being simplistic, we have computers. We have networks, we have switches, we have keyboards, we have mouses and stuff like that. So instead of buying one and building one simulator, because we want to make sure that we control everything, we actually buy a thousand of computers, we actually buy a thousand of network cards, routers and stuff like that. And one of our requirements is that even the chip version of, let's say, a uh, 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 NIC, network card, the chip revision is the same for everything. So what this allows us to do, it allows us to at least uh, perform some tests on one uh, machine. So we build a simulation with NIC, uh, et cetera, et cetera. We set up the BIOS to the same version, the BIOS to the same settings and stuff like that. And we run a series of tests on that stack. After that stack is qualified, then we put the simulation and then we can test the simulation. So means that our way of controlling at least the infrastructure is we used something that has been qualified by our department once and then we can replicate that thing. It goes to an extent that we even, uh, because some machines are, are running Windows, um, if you look at the, uh, uh, the path, when you, when you say, okay, I want you to add this into, into the path variable, all the uh, variables and the way the path is structured from one computer to the other to one simulator to the other is exactly the same. So we don't have to guess that maybe someone changed something somewhere, it's exactly the same. And that's how you can make, uh, you can have a re, um, an environment which is stable, you don't introduce any change, hardware-wise or uh, software-wise. Um, another thing which uh, is uh, very important into the, uh, into the aviation is traceability. And we treat simulators the same way we treat uh, airplanes. If you want to change a bulb into an airplane, you cannot change a bulb yourself. You have to have 
a work order, you have to call a mechanic, the mechanic has to be certified, the mechanic has to come and change the bulb, the bulb has to be certified. There is someone else looking for the guy, they sign up the paper and they put the paper into, st into storage. Um, why we're we doing this? Again, for liability reasons. And also, it avoids the, the fact that, you know, um, Going, I think you've, you've seen that in, into real life. You go in production, something doesn't work, say, oh no, I know where it's at, I'm going to patch it. Okay? You might patch something into production, but if you don't create a ticket, if you don't feedback this into your system, maybe on the next deployment you're going to have the same issue. And that's where um, aviation is very important because we learn from anything. It could be an accident, when you have an accident into aviation, there is the ICAO kicking in or aviation authority kicking in and they try to understand why it happened and they try to, to implement something in, in order to avoid the problem to come back. And it's the same thing for us in terms of software. If we see a problem, we're going to create a, a JIRA ticket, we're going to have traceability, but then we're going also to create a test in order to demonstrate that this problem never occurred into the, diff, uh, into the next uh, deliveries. So what's going to happen is that you have a fixed base of tests at the very beginning of the aircraft life, and at the end of the aircraft life, say 10 years down the road, you will have all your issues that you discovered, well, there is a test associated with it in order to uh, perform non-regression. And like I said, it, those machines are built for, for more than 20 years, and it's, it should be possible, based on the sole documentation that was given, uh, to reconstruct pretty much uh, a simulator. We're talking about anywhere between 20 and 80 million line of code and about 1 million mechanical parts for a full flight simulator. So it's very uh, complicated, uh, complicated stuff. I'm going to talk about check versus uh, testing. Uh, this is, uh, for, for me, a very, uh, very important di uh, difference. Uh, checking is like checklists, or checking is like you have a set of inputs, and then you can verify the output. So 2 plus 3 equals 5, then you can say check. Testing is just, um, it's more about discovering stuff. And that's where we, we make the, the difference in between checking and testing. Checking can be automated easily because you have a set of inputs and then you can verify the, uh, compared to, to an output. Testing is a little bit more complicated. Uh, why is this complicated? Well, let's go back to the example of the uh, exploded tire on, onto the airplane. Um, so we can simulate that we have a tire exploded. How are you going to test that? Do you have data out of it? Well, in my case, Boeing never provided me some data. So, well, we exploded the tire for you and these all the data we collected, okay? They haven't done that. So, you need to find a way to say, well, this is good, so if I have a problem in court, uh, then I can demonstrate that is, uh, that is good. And this is where I'm going to deviate a little bit from the presentation. Um, what I did in that instance is I tried to figure out all the parameters that could impact uh, the result of a test. So I said, well, the humidity of the air is important, the uh, wind uh, direction is very important, the altitude is very important, uh, the condition of the runway, if you have a wet runway versus a dry runway, uh, if you have sand, if you have... Uh, water, whatever. So I tried to figure out all those parameters and then I created a test into a framework called fitness. We're going to see fitness later in there. At least what I was able to is based on my airline experience and other airlines feedback, they say, well, your thing looks correct. And then I was able to run this test automatic on every release, and it was providing me al al almost always the same result, meaning that if I blow this tire, the airplane is going to stop after 27 seconds, and I'm going to change heading by maybe two degrees. Meaning that if someone change into the airplane model, engine model, weather model, ground model, I would have been able to spot it. And again, it's for traceability reason that I did that. 
I'm not sure it's 100% correct, but based on the information I have, to the best of my knowledge, I can say, well, I have been delivering uh, those performance for the last 10 years. So this is an important, uh, a, an important point here. If you don't have the data, or if you don't know what should be the real output, create a test that uh, controls all the situation, all the initial condition, and make sure that you can reproduce that output again and again. So if there is something that has changed, then you should be able to see uh, a change into, into your output. So you're not sure that it's correct, but at least you can say, well, something has changed. Um, back to the presentation, how we test, well, it's very easy. We just follow the requirements uh, and you go through, through these 600 pages and they tell you, or, well, okay, this is what you need to do in order to demonstrate that the autopilot is uh, properly uh, programmed. We're not going through, through there, it's just to give you uh, uh, an idea about what it is. So the, um, the models, uh, you have a, a mathematical model for everything into the simulation. You have a mathematical model for the engines, you got a mathematical model for the tires, for the brakes, for the hydraulic system and stuff like that. How we demonstrate that it's working? Um, we, uh, Boeing provide us uh, data from actual flight. So the first 777 they made, they put some instruments onto the airplane and they recorded a set of parameters. They recorded, for example, the position of a column in order to, uh, to control the pitch of the engine, they recorded the wind, they recorded the tire pressure, they recorded tons of parameters. And they give us those data and we re-inject those data into the simulation. So this is an example of data you have from, uh, from Boeing, okay? You inject them into the simulation, and now the, you have the output of a simulation. So you got the, sorry, you got the airspeed, you have the angle of attack, you got the uh, radio altimeter, and then the job of a test engineer and a test pilot is to explain any deviation from there. Meaning that you have the actual airplane information, which is the solid line, and then you got the simulator response, which is the dotted line. You will have to explain why it is, uh, it is different. So you don't have to make sure everything is 100% the same thing, but you have to give uh, um, a good explanation why the information might be different at a certain point in time, okay? In the end, we have uh, to demonstrate that the simulator is working. We have about and, uh, 150 and 200 test cases li like this. Um, and we, it's the binder we give to the Aviation Authority is about 2,500 pages of plots like that. And they have to go through all those plots as we do also before handing them over those data. Uh, in order to make sure that everything has an explanation and, it, and it's uh, compliant. Now we're going to check for abnormal condition and that's where we're going back to the uh, uh, landing gear and the, um, and the tire. So what you have on the right hand side on the, uh, on the corner is an actual uh, landing gear panel of a 777. That's one of the equipment I have into the simulator. On the lower screen, you will have um, what a pilot can see about uh, the landing gear system into the 777. And on the left side, you have the legacy procedure we developed in order to test the flight, uh, the flight simulator and to test especially the, uh, the landing gear system. So one other thing um, happened into, this, uh, into, the, into the test procedure is if you look at the test procedure, you have a mix of uh, checks. You have checks which are related to landing gear itself, but you can see that you have checks which are related to the sound system you have checks which are related also to the motion system, the vibration. What's going to happen is when you start flying into the air and the landing gear is down, you're going to have some vibration. 
you felt that when you when you when you when you take a, a flight, you you will feel the vibration, and that's something which, from my perspective, didn't have to be there, because what it's telling me here, it's telling me that I need to have a simulator in order to test that thing. Do you remember at the very beginning of a presentation, I showed you the um, computers, the IPTs, and the full flight simulator? What they are in common is that they, it is the same software. So again, what I did, I refactored all those kind of tests and uh, move part of a test onto a desktop simulation. And what I was able to do with that I was able to shave about three weeks of testing onto a real simulator. So I had to choose in between, because we, got, we are so strict into the way we control environments, we control software, I had to trust the system and say, if the engineer or whoever is responsible for it tells me that the simulation that runs on my desktop computer is exactly the same one that runs on the full flight simulator, it means that at least I can apply some of the checks that has been done onto the desktop simulation. I can apply the result directly to the full flight simulation. So if you control your environment and if you are really narrow the scope of your tests, then you can benefit for a lower testing platform to a higher uh, testing platform. So when you look also at this test procedure, uh, what's going to happen if I have the panel missing? Those are real air airplane parts. We calling Boeing and we say, well, we need to have this, uh, this part. Just imagine if I go into the simulator and that thing is not present. What's going to happen to my test procedure? Most probably I will not be able to run the test. Why is because this panel is missing? It goes to the second point where how you report information to stakeholder. Well, if I would be the regular test engineer, I could have put fail pretty much on everywhere. And then what I'm going to show to the stakeholder is landing gear system, 85% failure. Is it something you really want to do? The answer is most probably no. Why is because when I talk to a stakeholder, I'm not only reporting issues, I'm reporting, well, test scores. I'm reporting stuff which is an impediment for the project. In that instance, I prefer to report to the stakeholder, I need your help in order to order ASAP this part so I can test. And this is where the, as a tester, uh, you, you bring value to the project. You can just bring numbers and say, well, 85%. But the real value of what you're doing is bring to the stakeholders what the issue is and what do you think is going to be uh, one of the uh, solutions to fix that, uh, that problem. So what happened also into the, um, and that's something again, I told you, if you want to talk to me after the talk and uh, tomorrow you will be able to, um, uh, to do so. Um, what happened is that the company has been building simulator for many years. The way they did it, they build the hardware, they build the software, they put that all together on a test site and then they send the VNV team in there. What could go wrong with that? When you're talking about a million uh, parts, uh, 150 kilometers of wires, uh, and uh, 20 or 80 million line of code, what could be wrong with this? Okay? Thing could be wrong. Now the problem, can you imagine if you try to raise the landing gear or to lower the landing gear, if the landing gear does not come out or, come, or just go in, where is the problem coming from? Is it a wiring problem? Is it a mechanical problem? Is it a software simulation problem? It's extremely hard to, um, uh, to debug. So what I did, again, is I tried to move some tests into manufacturing. So instead of having the whole thing tested by a VNV team, I said, well, maybe I'm not the right guy. Maybe the tests are not at the right place. 
And that's the second point I would like you to take uh, with you, is when you design tests, maybe you're not the proper person to design the test. Maybe another team is better equipped or is in a better position to design a test than you are into, into your team. So don't stick to your test. Maybe you, you can move part of your test to somewhere else where it's going to be way much more efficient uh, to be done. So what happened with fitness is I moved some of the hardware tests into the factory floor. Um, they were able to uh, check the switches and check different, different things uh, on my behalf, so I don't have to perform uh, those uh, checks again in the cockpit. Why I choose fitness? First of all, it's because it's human readable format, so you can write tests in fitness into human readable format, and fitness provides artifact. So what's going to happen is that for the guy who built the panel and who is going to test the panel, he has to log in with his NT account. Then he has to perform the tests. Then for traceability reason, I know that the test was performed on that machine and it was that NT account that was, uh, that was used to, uh, to do it. So I'm, full f uh, it's a full f I'm fulfilling the requirements of the Aviation Authority to be able to trace everything from uh, who did it, when, where. Then I had also some uh, interesting discussions about um, uh, hardware boxes. Um, into the simulation, we're not simulating everything. Sometimes we're buying uh, parts from uh, Boeing or Honeywell. Those are actual aircraft boxes. So I can put those box into a real airplane and fly the airplane. I'm totally entitled to. And one of the things um, I was doing, uh, the company was doing, they were trying to test the logic inside those boxes. And then I said, well, something is wrong here because what, what, why are you trying to achieve here? You're taking something that has been built by another company, by, tested by another company, and you're trying to integrate and test it while you should just do the integration part of it. So that's the same thing in, in software. When you're using third party, you have to make sure it's either you would like to double check what they've done, but I think it's not our role to do that unless the contract states otherwise. Uh, when you take a third party piece of equipment, you should be just able to uh, integrate and think the best way of testing that equipment within the, the simulation. So the way you're doing it, you just look at the inputs of a system and then you just verify the outputs based on uh, your knowledge uh, about the system. I'm going to talk about the context-driven uh, testing. Uh, you can Google for that, and I'm going to focus only on uh, one part of it. Um, why I'm talking about context-driven testing is because after many years of testing experiments, when I looked onto uh, internet, I discovered that I was doing context-driven testing into aviation meaning that I was applying some different test methodology and strategies based on the context, which is like, when you, when you look at something which should be extremely rigid, it doesn't, it doesn't go along, but it, but it works. And I'm going to show you how it works. So you can Google for that, uh, context-driven testing. It's very simple, seven principles. Uh, I'm going to focus on about the principle number one. The value of any practice depends on, the, on, this, on its context. I think most of you are using logs files. Who doesn't use log files here? Okay, so I guess everybody's using log files. How many of you are putting a timestamp into your log files? Yeah, pretty much. You know what is the red line is? This is the date line. Line. Meaning if you cross that line, you're not going back by just a time zone. You're going back by 23 hours, 59 minutes, 59 seconds. Have you ever thought about what your software is going to do in that case? Well, I think someone didn't knew about it. You know this plane? 
F22 Raptor. Ah, uh, it's just like 380 millions a pop. What happened for the first time in 2007, that airplane crossed this dateline. And what happened? They totally lost all the flight instruments. And they were extremely lucky because they were being refueled in the air and the tankers, the Texaco we call them, they were around and they were able to follow the Texaco back to Hawaii. Otherwise, those planes and those two pilots, they would have been dead into the, into the water. So when you think about testing, well, you maybe have tested something related to dates, but I don't think you've tested to the extent that you can go back pretty much one day in the past. Or if you cross the line in the other direction, that you can have a hole of pretty much 24 hours into your logs. Uh, um, long story short, why I wanted to be an airline pilot, like I said, or like uh, we said, is because I've seen problems into specification. You know Gherkin's language? And I'm pretty sure you're going to be able to do this. Given weapon system is armed, when pilot press on the weapon release, then weapon is released. Straightforward? So far so good, even at 5 p.m. in the evening? Yes? Okay, we got it, so we can release the bomb. So from a gyra perspective, it's easy to write this and say, well, I got a test case for it. Yeah, sure. How about that? <laughs> Do you think your test case pass? Yes, my test case pass. Well, okay, explain me why the heck I have a wreck of uh, $250 million plus a pilot dead somewhere. So this is the message I would like you to walk away also from that presentation. You can be just coders and testers like I am and look at cold data and say, this is how, it, how, how, how the requirement is. But if you can try to enlarge your, your domain knowledge and try to understand how the application is used, most probably you're going to be able to avoid costly uh, problems like, like that one. A last example uh, is going to be about temperature. In simulation, of course, we have to, uh, to deal with, uh, with temperature, and one way of calculating the actual temperature is we're using uh, some data like uh, relative humidity and, uh, and uh, dew point. Um, and of course, you can create you know, nice J unit uh, around it, um, and temperature because you know, we have to use uh, a float in order to represent it into a, into, into, into a good way. From my perspective, as an airline pilot or as a test pilot, a float and a J unit test on that thing where it says minus something to plus something, no value. Well, no value. It has some value maybe from a technical point of view, but for, for me, it's, it's very uh, low value. Just think what's going to happen around zero degrees centigrade into a simulation. Someone has an idea? Someone wants to say something? Exactly. Water turns to ice. So the most interesting thing for me would be around zero centigrade. That's where I got a really interesting value. Since it's simulation, it's digital world, and maybe it's new for you, but runways, they're not always flat. Just imagine if the zero degree is on the top of a hill on that runway. For, for a software, what's going to happen if I go downhill? Well, on top of it, I will, if, if I'm 0 0.1 degree, it's going to be water. As soon as I'm going down, then it's going to be high. Is it going to be a good representation of the actual simulation and physics? Hell no, okay? So again, as developers and testers, the more we know about the domain, the domain, the way it's going to be used, the more 
a useful test we're going to be able to, uh, to develop. Multi-million dollar bug, you know that one, Ariane 5, uh, an overflow somewhere, it costed a couple of uh, billion dollars. Uh, so the initial system, it's, it's funny because it was one of the systems I worked on, on Ariane 4, but I swear to God it was not my fault. <laughs> Um, the system was working on Ariane 4 because the rocket was less powerful and the acceleration was way much less on 4 compared to 5. When they, when they move the system to the other, they say, well, you know, it's going to work. And of course it didn't work because the acceleration was faster and the, uh, the rocket blew. Um, 777, my airplane. It's very funny because when we develop software, um, on the 777, you have a counter, which is counting minutes or seconds or whatever. And the interesting thing about 777 is, if you don't know about it, an airplane 777 flies at least 20 hours per day. 20 hours. It's just four hours on the ground, every day. And what happened is that they fly so often that they are never uh, powered off. If they are never powered off, What's going to happen to those counters? They're going to overflow. And what happened is that a, a timer in, in different system, the timers went out, it was an handle exception, and then suddenly the electric system was shutting down, the hydraulic system was shutting down and stuff like that. So at the very beginning, you don't know that a 777 is going to be operated 20, 24 hours a day. But again, it's open your brain and try to think what could be wrong. And that's what pilots we are trained for. When we take off, we're not going to say, well, you know, everything is fine, everything is good. No, the thing as pilots, when we take off, before taking off, we try to have covered pretty much all bad situations that could happen. And we discuss it each other uh, into the cockpit, saying, well, if we have this problem, we're going there. If we have this problem, we're going there. Be prepared. And that made me uh, very proficient in my testing uh, activity because I'm not looking at the happy path. I'm looking at, you know, all the sideways, what could go wrong into, into a flight. Um, the new Airbus uh, 300Ms uh, on takeoff, unfortunately, all the people on board died in that, uh, in that day. They had a uh, problem into the software. Three engines out of four uh, went out. Uh, they found the bug into, into the software, but it went totally... Uh, nobody saw it. And uh, in Canada, they had, uh, and in the States, they had a, an X-ray machine, which was a, a killer machine. And um, it was a problem with uh, a coefficient they used. So instead of sending a certain dose of radiation, it was like a thousand times uh, way much more, and they killed people instead of treating people uh, against, against cancer with, uh, with that. Well, the conclusion about this is, um, if you look at a product, a product is there to solve a problem. If the problem is not well defined, then you will have pro uh, issues in order to achieve uh, finalizing the, pro uh, the, the product itself. Meaning in aviation, usually we try to define everything up front and then we do it because we know exactly what we're going to do. Uh, today, with the agile environment, it's harder to do this because we're trying to achieve something, but we don't know when it's going to be uh, totally, um, totally finished. Process. Despite the fact that we have checklists, that we are following a process, you can have gaps into that process. And people, they do stuff, but the most interesting thing about people is that they can think. So just go back to what happened into those incidents where it cost billions of dollars. They had a process, they had a product, but something went unnoticed. What and who could have noticed that? Definitely a human. So be aware, try to have your eyes open about every requirement you're manipulating and be ready to challenge those things. Because you, the only flexible enough 
you have only one into the whole thing, into the process, who can say, well, I think something is wrong here. Thank you. And then I think we can go for, for questions. So thank you. Whoever has many, some questions. We can take one or two questions for the ones most eager. No questions. Well, Mr. Baudouin, thank you. Thank you. So like I said,